All right, uh, this is uh, Physical Science 102, and we're going to take a look at Chapter 19, The Atmosphere. Uh, and in this particular chapter, we're interested primarily in the uh, structure of the atmosphere and how that structure relates can be related to certain weather phenomena, but we don't get into weather in a serious way uh, until chapter 20. So first I need to uh, share the PowerPoints. Let's see. I think this is where we're at right here. Okay. And what I'm going to do, let's see, I need to rearrange these things a little bit. Let's make a slideshow first. There we go. Okay. And All right, chapter 19. There are just five sections in this uh, chapter, but it's full of information. <clears throat> so if we, if we go back and look at definitions of um, pertaining to the atmosphere, first we need to look at, since we're, we're talking about the atmosphere of the Earth, in particular. And I may draw in um, references to other planets, but only when it serves to uh, reinforce and uh, shine some light on the uh, atmosphere of the Earth. So uh, as, a, as a, an overarching uh, discipline, Earth science, it just covers everything there is to know about the Earth. All aspects is the way they put it here. <clears throat> and that includes both the land, sea, and the air. And um, actually, that's, that's an important point to make because the atmosphere does not exist in a bubble. The atmosphere exists in contact with the land and with the sea. So they each have an have their influence and impact on the atmosphere. Um, by definition, the atmosphere is all the gas that is between the surface of the Earth and outer space. It is often referred to as an envelope. And uh, uh, compared to the the, the total thickness of the earth, the atmosphere is extremely thin. It's like a sheet of paper laying on a, on a uh, uh, rubber ball. But it, it does serve a, a very important purpose, uh, several purposes, as a matter of fact. Uh, one of which is uh, it uh, absorbs the shock of many meteorites that strike the earth on a daily basis. Fortunately, most of, most of them are so small that they burn up in the atmosphere. Uh, but even the bigger ones are slowed down uh, by the atmosphere. Um, it provides uh, air that we breathe. Because of its composition, it's, it has a, a rather large percentage of oxygen, which is good for we heterotrophs, <clears throat> uh, but it also provides uh, other gases like carbon dioxide, which is essentially food for green plants. Okay, atmospheric science, just the study of all these aspects of the atmosphere. Um, it hasn't always, it's, 
like most sciences, the uh, atmospheric science is not stagnant. Uh, it, it develops um, in concert with the development of new technologies. So um, when the thermometer was developed, we learned how to take temperatures of the atmosphere. Uh, when the barometer was developed, we used it to um, uh, measure air pressure and then correlate that with weather patterns. Those are just two examples. And um, now we have the ability to look at the atmosphere from above using satellites. Uh, we can look at it from the ground with different wavelengths of light, um, particularly radar. And we can see things that are going on in the atmosphere in greater detail and at greater distances uh, from the surface of the Earth using radar. In fact, there are some satellites that use radar uh, from above to investigate the atmosphere and other aspects of the uh, surface of the Earth. All right. So what do we mean by meteorology? Well, it's, it's not the study of meteors. <laughs> meteorology is derived from a term that uh, meteor refers to the atmosphere. So this, in meteorology, we typically study the lower parts of the atmosphere because that's where the weather happens. Um, And that's become a, uh, uh, a restriction on uh, meteorology in recent times. Um, whereas originally meteorology meant the study of the entire atmosphere. But um, we've sort of shrunk that down so that we can look at uh, just those parts of the atmosphere that actually contribute to weather. Um, so what's the difference between weather and climate? It's a temporal difference. Understand what temporal means. Temporal refers to, implies time. So that's, there's a difference in the, the length of time that is involved in the study. Uh, over a short time scale, we're talking about weather. Right, um, hours, days. Sometimes we can stretch it to weeks, but it's it's pretty difficult for for most um, meteorologists to project weather uh, into the future more than accurately for more than um, twenty four hours. Climate is a, is a broader process over a longer time scale. And since uh, climate is based upon weather over a longer period of time, um, it should be obvious that any inferences that we make about climate are even more suspect because of the longer time scale. Uh, we can't do very well with weather, and we are even worse with climate. So in this chapter, we're going to look at things like uh, what's the atmosphere made of? What are its components? Uh, what are its uh, primarily physical properties? But there will be some uh, discussion of chemical properties as well when appropriate and some of the mechanisms that are uh, operative in the atmosphere. OK, uh, then when we get to chapter 20, we'll, we'll expand upon those mechanisms and uh, discuss um, atmospheric processes in greater detail. OK, what's the composition of the atmosphere? Um, well, it's a mixture of gases. And in fact, um, uh, 
since in the uh, first chapters of this uh, course, you study chemistry and we touched upon gases and what constitutes a uh, solution or uh, a heterogeneous mixture is uh, as opposed to a homogeneous mixture, which is a solution. Gases are a solution. They're a homogeneous mixture. It always, anytime you put two or more gases together, you always get a homogeneous mixture. It's a solution. And that's the atmosphere. That's what we breathe. We breathe a solution of gases. Um, uh, in addition to that, there are other components that uh, should be viewed as uh, not solutions. In other words, they're suspended particles of some type or another. Sometimes they're liquid droplets, sometimes they're solid particles. Um, so the atmosphere is, an ex is, a, is a very complex mixture. Um, 99% of the composition of the, the, the gases in the atmosphere are nitrogen and oxygen. Um, and they appear as diatomics. And so when you studied the periodic table in previous chapters, um, there were some of those elements that naturally occur as diatomic elements, and they're all gases. So hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, I, well, bromine's a liquid and iodine's a solid. I misspoke earlier. Those diatomics, that's the way they naturally occur. And these uh, two primary gases, the nitrogen and oxygen in the atmosphere, um, make up 99% of the atmosphere. Um, I believe nitrogen is about 78%, oxygen is about 21%. And then the other 1% is composed primarily of argon uh, with some other uh, minor gases mixed in like uh, carbon dioxide. In fact, I think carbon dioxide is, is pushing 0.04% uh, now. And there are other things like uh, methane, some man-made uh, components like uh, uh, fluoro, fluoro, uh, uh, chlorofluorocarbons, freons. Um, so when I, when I gave you the composition of air in terms of nitrogen and oxygen, I was really speaking of dry gas. In other words, there are no other thing, no other components in there but the gases. But in that case, that would be correct. 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and the rest of these other gases. Um, and then um, we have to mix in the uh, non-solution, the heterogeneous components, like solid particles, dust particles, for instance, and uh, liquids, primarily water, water vapor. Now, water vapor can exist as a gas in which case it would be a homogeneous mixture uh, in the atmosphere. And, and the range of water vapor can be very widely distributed. And then sometimes it condenses and forms water droplets. Okay, so uh, let's see, I mentioned um, these four primary gases here. There are the traces. Um, noble gases, neon, helium. There's a little bit of hydrogen, some nitrous oxide, uh, even some methane. Uh, water vapor, which I said wi widely varies, right? So that's, that's accurate there. Carbon monoxide, which is an incomplete combustion product, and uh, largely the consequence of internal combustion uh, engines. <clears throat> 
Ammonia is a product. Ammonia um, could be man-made or it could be natural sources. But we don't have time to go into that discussion. Then you have various solid particles. Um, I mentioned that one. Internal combustion engine produces the uh, uh, carbon monoxide. Uh, when uh, gasoline or diesel fuel, for that matter, is burned in an internal combustion engine, um, the tendency is for the reaction to not be completed. So one of the incomplete combustion byproducts is carbon monoxide. Normally what you would expect is carbon dioxide. That would be a complete combustion product from internal combustion engine. So that's why um, in many industrialized countries, uh, internal combustion engines are required to have a catalytic converter attached to their exhaust stream so that these incomplete combustion products can be um, uh, converted to from carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide. And then there are other things like um, uh, nitrogen oxides, which need to be uh, broken down into nitrogen gas and other products. So the catalytic converter does uh, a lot of different things. Okay. Um, these minor components fluctuate widely, depending on where you are uh, on the surface of the earth and the proximity, your proximity when you measure uh, to um, industrialized countries and uh, metropolitan areas, large cities. Then you'll see variations in these uh, minor components. But the major components are relatively constant. Those, uh, let's back up. The nitrogen and oxygen definitely are reasonably constant. Uh, argon's fairly constant. Carbon dioxide is creeping up over time as we burn more and more fossil fuels. Um, <laughs> The, um, what's usually brushed over in a discussion of the interaction between living and non-living systems is that we normally consider carbon dioxide, of course, as a food for green plants. Oxygen is required uh, for animals. Oxygen is also a waste product from green plants. Whereas uh, we produce carbon dioxide as a waste product, plants produce oxygen as a waste product. So there's a, an active exchange there. But the one that uh, largely goes unreported is nitrogen. And nitrogen is involved, intimately involved in nutrition of plants. The problem is that they're all green plants in and of themselves do not have the biochemistry, the mechanisms, to take nitrogen from the air and what we say, fix it in a usable form. Um, if you look into the, the uh, destination of nitrogen in living cells, you'll find that it's not this. It's not that. It's usually derived from this and this. Right, so these are fixed forms of nitrogen, and it's very difficult to do that, to convert this to that, because the bond that holds the two nitrogen atoms together is very strong. In fact, it's a, it's a triple bond. It's difficult to break. And green plants, plants for that matter, uh, don't have the ability to do it. So they generally form symbiotic relationship with microorganisms. And the microorganisms have the ability to convert that 
in the one of these, usually this one. Now we since have, have um, developed industrial means of converting atmospheric nitrogen into fixed forms. In fact, the, the Haber process takes uh, atmospheric nitrogen and converts it into ammonia. Uh, that's a long story, so I won't, I won't go into that in detail right now. We're trying to talk about atmosphere and not um, uh, a lot of chemistry. So when we think about um, the atmosphere, it's helpful sometimes to think of it in terms of equilibrium. In other words, there are processes going on in the atmosphere that are in balance. In other words, they might go one way uh, in uh, one type of reaction, either chemical or physical changes, but they'll also go back the other way. Um, and I mentioned one earlier, the photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide and fixes the carbon, but it releases oxygen as a waste product. And then uh, animals take that oxygen and the uh, fixed forms of carbon that have been produced by plants and uh, recombine them and gain energy from them. Um, producing carbon dioxide as waste gas. So there's an equilibrium there between uh, in, the, uh, in the atmosphere mediated by living systems. Uh, I mentioned this one uh, just a minute ago with the nitrogen. Okay, let's look at some physical properties of the atmosphere. The atmosphere, uh, the gases in the atmosphere and anything in the atmosphere has mass, which means that it can be attracted toward other um, matter in the universe. So there's a gravitational attraction of the gases to the earth. And for that reason, uh, they tend to, as they get closer to the surface of the earth, the density of the air increases. <laughs> and we find as we go from the surface of the earth up, the density decreases, decreases, and you can measure that pressure difference as you ascend. This is important to recognize because uh, over half of the Earth's atmosphere lies below about seven miles high. And 99% of it lies below 19 miles. That, that's a pretty far distance above the surface of the Earth, but that encompasses most of the Earth's atmosphere within 19 miles. Um, and it just gradually thins as you get further out. And there's sort of a, in fact, the boundary between the Earth's atmosphere and outer space fluctuates with temperature and other factors. Um, um, solar wind will have an impact on where that boundary lies. And that's one of the problems with um, uh, satellites in the Earth's revolving around the Earth in low Earth orbit because they encounter this tenuous atmosphere. And since they're moving so fast, then there is significant friction and that will decay the orbit. So um, measures have to be taken. If you want your satellite to stay up there, you have to add a little momentum to it uh, periodically to keep it in orbit. And that, in a word, we're just saying that there is no clearly defined upper limit to the atmosphere. Um, there are various uh, physical laws um, governing the behavior of gases. And uh, they were studied in the early part of the uh, 18th century. 
um, been defined in terms of pressure. In fact, pressure, volume, temperature, and the number of molecules in the amount of gas. If you know these four terms, then you can completely define the gas behavior. Well, the atmosphere is no different. Um, it's, it's not encased or enclosed in a vessel, but the uh, gravity of the earth confines it to the surface. And the gases will behave based upon these various laws. Boyle's law relates pressure and volume. Charles' law mentioned here relates um, volume and temperature. Um, and those are the two main ones that we're considering in the behavior of the Earth's atmosphere. So as the temperature increases, the atmosphere expands. And when it expands, its density decreases. Why? Because density is equal to mass, mass divided by volume, right? Mass is not gonna change. But if you change the volume, if you increase the volume in the denominator, that makes density less. So the density of the gas will decrease as temperature increases. And what that means is uh, there's a difference in buoyancy. So uh, a mass of gas that has a lower density than the surrounding gas will tend to rise. So if we, um, if we heat up gas near the surface of the earth, then that bubble will rise. And as it rises, the surrounding pressure decreases and it tends to expand. And as it expands, it cools and it reaches a point where it matches the um, the atmosphere surrounding it, and there we have a point of stability. In other words, now we're at equilibrium. Okay, oops, I uh, clicked it too soon. Um, well, that's nothing new, that last statement. The atmosphere merges with space. <laughs> Okay, we can subdivide the atmosphere into regions. Now these are not these are not uh, hard and fast demarcations, but they're um, they help us uh, describe and hopefully understand how the atmosphere behaves under certain conditions by uh, marking these different regions. <laughs> and it's primarily based upon vertical differences. So as we rise in the atmosphere, what varies? Well, um, primarily it's temperature. Temperature decreases as you rise from the surface of the earth, but you reach, um, a point where that uh, change in temperature undergoes a different trend. All right, so I'm gonna show you that in just a second. There are other things that we can take into consideration um, for identifying regions of the atmosphere, such as the uh, amount of ozone in the atmosphere. So let's look at temperature first. This is the major division that occurs within the atmosphere and primarily based upon uh, vertical, the distance above the surface of the earth. Okay. Um, from the surface up to about 10 miles, give or take, is the troposphere. And the troposphere is where the weather happens. This is where we get, um, rain, snow, um, hail, uh, other atmospheric effects, primarily uh, lightning 
Um, so this is where it happened, troposphere. This is where most of the weather happens. And uh, it's primarily because that's where the atmosphere is densest. Above that is the stratosphere. And uh, it roughly occurs between 10 and 30 miles. And I've given you both miles and kilometers here. So for reference, up to about 50 kilometers is the stratosphere. Above that um, is the mesosphere. So it, it goes from 30 to 50 miles or up to about 80 kilometers. And then there's the thermosphere. Um, 80 kilometers up to the exosphere and the outer space. And the, the exosphere and, and outer space, yeah, they're kind of very tenuous. And very often they're just um, incorporated into the classification of thermosphere. Okay, you may recognize the prefix here, thermo, so it must have something to do with temperature, with heat. Okay, troposphere first. This is where 80% of the atmosphere is located. And almost all of the clouds and moisture are concentrated in this region. Um, there, there are some clouds in the lower stratosphere, um, but most of what develops uh, weather-wise occurs in the troposphere. There's a continual mixing and movement of air masses in the troposphere. Um, and in fact, um, most of the weather that uh, has an impact on human activity occurs in the lower troposphere. Uh, the upper troposphere becomes involved only with very severe weather and extreme things like um, thunderstorms, hurricanes, um, even tornadoes. So if you start moving your weather, the, the weather forming um, atmospheric uh, clouds, <clears throat> Um, they start moving up into the upper troposphere. They do so because there's so much more activity, they need the space. A and for other reasons, physical reasons. Okay. Um, as a general rule, the atmosphere, the temperature of the atmosphere decreases an average of six and a half degrees for every kilometer. So, and this is not hard and fast. This is just a general uh, decrease in temperature as you rise, six and a half degrees Celsius for every kilometer. So if the troposphere is 10 kilometers, uh, 10 miles, 16 kilometers, then you could say, all right, 16 kilometers times six and a half will tell you that by the time you get to the upper troposphere, you're down to minus 50 degrees uh, Celsius. It's a very cold. Although there are places on the surface of the earth that can get that cold. So there have to be other factors that, that are taken into account when we see these types of temperatures on the surface of the earth. Stratosphere above the troposphere. Once we include the, the stratosphere, now we're talking about almost 100% of the uh, atmosphere on the surface of the Earth, with just a tiny fraction left over for the rest of those regions. And remember, as you go higher and higher, the uh, pressure decreases, the density also decreases as you go higher. So you have um, less and less gas. That's why they, uh, above, um, I forget the exact 
value above about 15, between 15 and 20,000 feet, um, you can't breathe. Uh, breathing is difficult because the air gets so thin. That's why um, mountain climbers who uh, attack high mountains like the Himalayas, uh, Mount Everest, um, you don't make it to the top without supplemental oxygen. Okay. Um, at the point where we start the stratosphere, the temperature actually begins to increase. But it's not uniform. It's not as predictable as with the troposphere. Now, there's one... <laughs> Um, important caveat, the temperature may be decreasing with height in the troposphere and it changes uh, differently for the other layers. But what you have to understand is temperature is an intensity property. It's an intensive factor. In other words, um, uh, it doesn't matter how much of something there is uh, to describe the temperature. So you could have a gas that is at one atmosphere at a given temperature. And you could have a gas that it's a tenth of an atmosphere at the same temperature. Remember, temperature is the average kinetic energy of the molecules in the substance. Okay? So what that means is if you've got more molecules at that kinetic energy, there's going to be more energy, right? And the measure of energy or heat is an extensive property or a capacity factor. In other words, it does vary with the amount. So you can have the same temperature at a lower in the atmosphere as higher in the atmosphere, but the amount of energy at those two same temperatures will be much, much higher at the lower part of the atmosphere than it is at the higher atmosphere. It's important to make that distinction because when we say uh, the temperature um, at the extreme upper atmosphere is like five, six hundred degrees Celsius, there's not much heat there. I mean, you have high average kinetic energy, but you don't have any heat or not much. So there's, that's an important distinction between temperature and energy. Okay. Um, so most of the heat content of the atmosphere is in the lower troposphere. That's, that's the takeaway from this discussion. Now, how about the mesosphere and then the thermosphere? Okay. Um, in fact, there's a, I've got a little uh, chart or diagram coming up that'll put these all in perspective. So we saw that the uh, stratosphere, the temperature started increasing. And then we get to the mesosphere and the temperature starts decreasing again with altitude. And the atmosphere is extremely thin at this uh, altitude, primarily because of gravity. Gravity is less at that, at that height. Uh, so the density is going to be very, very low. Now, above the mesosphere is another region where the temperature again starts to increase, just like it did with the stratosphere. And this is the thermosphere. And it's largely, um, it gains its energy from the sun itself. That's where the sun uh, has access. See, as the sun's rays pass through the atmosphere, they are absorbed, many of them. Uh, and uh, especially in the lower atmosphere, that's what heats the atmosphere direct heating and heating of the surface of the earth, which re-radiates. 
uh, to the lower atmosphere and conducts also. But when you get to the upper atmosphere, there's nothing between the atmosphere and the sun. So those, uh, the wavelengths of light coming from the sun that are particularly absorbed by certain molecules in the upper atmosphere excite them and that increases their temperature. But there's not much heat there, just like I said before. High temperature, low heat. Okay, so here's a, um, a description. We're combining all of these things together into one picture where we have the uh, major divisions with altitude, and these, these are a rough divisions here. Notice that the temperature decreases here as you increase altitude in the troposphere. And then in the stratosphere, the temperature starts increasing again. And then in the mesosphere, it decreases again. And then thermosphere, it goes back up. So that's general trends for those regions. Um, the exosphere, if we're going to actually talk about the exosphere, it's going to be located way up here in the top uh, upper regions of the thermosphere and even further into outer space. So there's really no defined boundary between the atmosphere and space. And it fluctuates, it goes up and down with seasons, with whatever's happening in the lower atmosphere influences how that bulge occurs in the atmosphere. So if you were at a given height circling the earth in a satellite, you'd be coming along and you might go through a region that's almost devoid of atmosphere. And then you come along and hit one of these bubbles and it, it robs you of some momentum. And you will actually, since you slow down, you'll, your orbit will decay some. And then you go on your way and then you hit another one and it'll decay again. So when that happens, at a certain point, controllers in, on the ground have to um, use the uh, control jets in that satellite to boost its orbit up again. Okay. So we also talked about not just temperature, but maybe classifying the atmosphere and, and subdividing it in terms of ozone. The ozone concentration will vary um, with height. We reach a, a, a region in the upper atmosphere where um, the ultraviolet radiation from the sun is, is still rather strong. In other words, ultraviolet radiation is, is uh, preferentially absorbed as it penetrates the atmosphere. So in the upper atmosphere, the ultraviolet radiation interacts with oxygen and produces ozone, right? Remember, oxygen is this, typically, and then ozone is that. Well, the nice thing about ozone is it is extremely good at absorbing ultraviolet radiation. So it, it, it forms a blanket and protects the surface of the Earth and all life on Earth from too much ultraviolet radiation, which is damaging to living cells. Um, uh, here's a, the reaction that occurs. Um, that ultraviolet radiation breaks apart the oxygen and produces free radicals. A free radical is any atom or molecule that has unpaired electrons. Right? So when we split this oxygen apart, now we've got, like that, we've got these two unpaired electrons. And free radicals are extremely reactive. So what happens is one of these uh, free radicals recombines with another oxygen molecule and makes ozone. 
So I'll combine one of these with another one of those and make that. Okay. Um, this occurs in the roughly in the middle of the stratosphere at about 30 kilometers above the surface of the earth. Now, if you want to convert uh, kilometers to miles, uh, the relationship is uh, one mile is equal to 1.6 kilometers. Right? So a mile is 60% bigger than a kilometer. So you just need to reduce 30 by 60%. 50% would be around 15. So it's around 16 miles, uh, equivalent to 30 kilometers. <laughs> All right. Sometimes this region is referred to as the ozonosphere. And it can stretch, it can be rather wide. 30 kilometers is sort of an average for the ozonosphere, but it can range uh, quite widely in altitude. Uh, depending upon the ozone concentration. Now, there are regions um, of the atmosphere that are um, almost devoid of ozone. Um, they're often referred to as ozone holes. Now, we don't know if they have always existed. They tend to occur at the poles, North and South Pole. So um, we, we haven't been studying it long enough to know if the ozone was uh, always complete blanket around the earth, or if it always existed with these holes at the poles. But what we have been able to in, in the decades that we've been measuring ozone in the stratosphere, that the holes at the poles have been getting bigger. Um, I mentioned that umbrella effect earlier. Um, now, we'll, um, we'll discuss in, I think, in just a minute or two, uh, one of the possible reasons for the increase of that, uh, the holes, the size of the holes in the ozone. Um, but there's very little ozone near the ground. Near, near the surface of the earth, uh, simply because ozone is extremely reactive. Um, and it, uh, even in the stratosphere, ozone's um, half-life is very short. I don't recall what the value is, but it has to be continuously replenished. And at the surface of the earth, um, there's not much of it because it's very reactive and, and it's not being replenished, uh, except through artificial means. Right? Some of the activities, uh, human activities, uh, will favor the production of ozone. And uh, ozone is so reactive that if you breathe it in small quantities even, uh, it will damage your cells. So that's why we're, we're concerned about ozone uh, production under certain circumstances. In fact, uh, when laser printers first appeared, one of the problems was these lasers have, are very energetic and as a byproduct of their uh, activity in the printing process, they produce ozone, or they did. And one of the ways that uh, it was controlled was uh, every printer had, um, ozone absorbing material that was in these packets that were stored inside the printer. Um, then a couple of developments occurred over, over the years. Uh, one is um, lasers were developed that were less prone to produce ozone, 
uh, different wavelengths, lower power, and it's not a problem anymore. Uh, the other thing is, uh, the first solution was uh, manufacturers built into their laser printers a sleep cycle so that the uh, if you're not using the printer, it'll go to sleep and it won't produce any ozone while it's asleep. Okay, another classification, not based on temperature, but based on the abundance of ions, and this is in the upper atmosphere, is the ionosphere. Now, there are different levels of ionosphere. Um, um, between 70 and 100 kilometers high. Uh, and it's characterized by high concentration of ions. And this is related to act actions from the sun. Uh, when the sun strikes, when those ultraviolet ray rays strike uh, molecules in the upper atmosphere, sometimes it knocks electrons off of them and makes ions. And in fact, we've, we can characterize different regions of the ionosphere. Uh, three major regions are, are designated D, E, and F. I don't know why they picked those letters. <laughs> I guess it was made more sense than ABC. <clears throat> so these uh, regions of the uh, upper atmosphere between 70 and 100 kilometers um, form these uh, abundant ion layers. And we know they're there because uh, of the uh, interaction of radio waves in, uh, in those regions. In other words, they form a reflective layer. So the radio waves that come up here and bounce off. And if they go through that one and hit this one, that means it's a different characteristic that we can identify based upon the uh, ability of that layer to bounce radio waves of different frequencies. Um, so uh, one example, uh, when I drive to and from um, another teaching engagement, uh, I do so, I have to get started early. So it's still dark out, the sun's not up, but the ionosphere is still there in the upper atmosphere. And I can pick up this station, 7.50 a.m. from Atlanta, Georgia, um, here in West Virginia. What happens is those uh, rays, those um, wavelengths from this station bounce off the ionosphere and come back down here in this area. And the only reason you can get them at night when it's dark, because there's less interference from other sources, either uh, natural or man-made. When the sun finally comes up, you can't pick up the station anymore. Uh, the other thing uh, that is beneficial from the ionosphere, the different layers of ionosphere, is that uh, shortwave radio operators, sometimes we call them hams, can communicate with others on the other side of the earth. Um, if they pick the right wavelength. Um, they use uh, megahertz range signals, whereas the, um, these AM stations are kilohertz. So they probably bounce off different layers. Okay. So here's an illustration of those, of those potential layers. Uh, D, E, and F, F is the highest, then E, then D is the lowest. And um, uh, here we go. Ozone layer is, is much lower, right? So, oh, okay, good. Uh, now that's an ionic layer, excuse me. Let me go back. There's uh, ozone layer, which we can actually bounce sound waves off of. The other layers, the D, E, and the F layers, uh, we need uh, light, electromagnetic radiation to bounce off of those. 
Okay. So we can connect with um, receivers on the other side of the planet using this uh, technique. Another, another evidence for the ionosphere is the northern and southern lights. The northern lights are called aurora borealis, borealis referring to the north, uh, and then aurora australis are the southern lights that occur uh, where we can't see them here. <laughs> In fact, we can't see them very well where we are here. You have to be further north to get really get a good uh, light show. These are generated, uh, these aurora are generated in the upper atmosphere because of the action of the solar wind and the magnetic field of the earth. <clears throat> so we have all these energetic particles coming in from the sun and they deliver a significant amount of energy to the atoms and ions in the upper atmosphere and then the uh, earth's magnetic field channels those ions so there's the earth and we have a magnetic field right north pole south pole and the sun right makes these ions and they are accelerated by the magnetic field in toward the poles. So they go in here and when they, when they reach um, a certain height, they interact with oxygen primarily and nitrogen molecules and they give up that energy and it forms light. Remember, one of the primary, one of the first laws that we learned in our study of chemistry is, is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. So if you deliver energy to these particles and they deliver energy further down, it's got to go somewhere. So if they slow down, if they lose their kinetic energy, then that amount of energy is delivered in the form of light. And light is energy, right? So there's, there's like a budget, right? If it comes in this way, it's got to go out that way. Um, and that's primarily due to the recombination of these ions and free electrons. Um, and when that happens, when those electrons return, to their atoms and neutralize the positive charge, then they give up that energy as light. <laughs> okay, so here's a picture of uh, an aurora from Alaska. So they're far enough north where you can see the, the lights. Okay. Um, so where does all the energy come from? Because the atmosphere of the Earth is in constant flux and it's delivering energy from one location to another, either uh, horizontally or vertically. So where does that energy come from? Well, most of it comes from the sun, which uh, heats up some of the atmosphere, heats up the Earth, uh, I'm going to show you a budget here in a second that accounts for where that energy goes. Um, there is some energy that comes from inside the Earth, but most that affects the atmosphere comes from the sun. Now, the sun is, is uh, 150 million kilometers away. <laughs> so um, a lot of that energy that the sun produces then never makes it to us. We get a very small fraction of it. Um, 
And that's primarily due to the inverse square law. So what does that mean? Well, when you studied the uh, in the first semester, I know that law was, was introduced. The inverse square laws that means that um, if you're twice the distance, if you move twice the distance from where you are now, you only get one quarter of the energy. Why? Because if you've got a square here, and then as it spreads out from this source, you don't just increase the distance or a linear, you increase an area. So we go from this distance to this distance, we have doubled the area of and, and spread that energy out over um, a square of the area. So if we, for some way, were able to um, uh, position a satellite at 75 million kilometers from the sun, it would be getting four times as much energy as we are. Okay, that's also known as insulation, right? Insulation is a, sh is a shortened version of uh, incoming solar radiation is one way to think of it. it. Actually, etymologically speaking, insulation does is not derived from incoming solar radiation. <laughs> that word sequence is derived from the Greek and Latin, I'm sure. Uh, but this is a convenient way to... Uh, memorize what that means. One factor that we can never lose sight of is that solar output is not constant. I mean, over long stretches of time, yeah, it averages out. But from day to day, from week to week, even from year to year, solar output changes over time. Um, one of the way, one of the reasons that insulation changes is because of the Earth's movement in its orbit and the tilt on its axis. Right? So if we have the sun here and we have our orbit here, then if the Earth is tilted like that, then on this side, it's tilted. This side is away from the sun. So it receives less radiation, but over here now it's on this side and it gets more radiation. That's why we have summer and winter. And changes in insulation uh, vary over the surface of the earth and what the earth is trying to do with seasonal changes is it's trying to send that excess energy to regions of the earth. It's trying to um, generate an equilibrium state. But since the Earth is always moving, it can never reach equilibrium. So the moral of that story is energy is insulation is unevenly distributed over the surface of the Earth. Um, That's true. Over time, the uh, upper regions of the Earth's atmosphere receive a relatively constant amount of solar radiation. And um, even though the output from the sun varies, uh, averaged over many years, the uh, amount of energy received by the upper atmosphere is, is relatively constant, constant. So insulation itself, averaged over time and over seasons, is relatively constant. Um, but it, you need a large, a long time scale because there are cycles in the uh, sun's output, like the 11 year sunspot cycle, uh, correlates with the amount of energy that is generated by the sun. 
So when you see very few sunspots, the output from the sun is very low relative to other times. And then uh, at the end of that 11 year cycle, the number of sunspots increases and the solar output is much greater. But over long stretches of time, um, the output of the sun is relatively constant. Now, the surface of the Earth only receives about 50% of the light that reaches the upper atmosphere. So if it's coming at us from the sun, then by the time the energy reaches the surface, it's only about 50%. Now, why is that? Well, there are various reasons. Um, if we consider 100% of the solar radiation here at the upper atmosphere, then what happens first? Well, about 15% of it is absorbed by the atmosphere. And those are pref preferential absorption of different wavelengths, uh, primarily ultraviolet absorbed by the ozone layer. Um, what else? Well, some of that radiation is scattered by the atmosphere. In other words, the light just bounces off the molecules or particles in the, in the upper atmosphere. Um, the cloud cover makes a huge difference in how much radiation reaches the surface. If you have lots of clouds, um, then on average, they reflect about 24% of the energy that reaches the upper atmosphere. And that amount um, combined with other reflected amounts, um, like light reflected from the ground, right? If we combine this reflected amount, 2%, 24%, and 7%, that accounts for 33% of the amount of energy that is, uh, that is not available to uh, be absorbed by anything in the atmosphere or the earth. So that reflected amount uh, is what we call albedo. So the, the amount of energy coming in, um, the insulation ratio to the uh, reflected light, is a measure of albedo. So 0.33 would be that ratio of light reflected from the Earth. The Earth has a pretty high albedo uh, compared to other heavenly bodies. Um, in fact, the moon, even though you think the moon is really bright, uh, its albedo is, is very low. I think it's around 1%. Okay, so what happens to the rest of the radiation? Well, we do get some scattering that actually reaches the ground. Okay, instead of bouncing off in, into the outer space, some of it reaches the ground. Some of it actually reaches the ground directly with no scattering whatsoever. And these are all different wavelengths. Right? We can consider the light from the sun as white light. It has a mixture of all the possible wavelengths. Some of that light goes actually goes through the clouds and um, reaches the ground. So the, the surface of the earth absorbs that light. And that accounts for about 50%. So let's see, five uh, plus 23 is 28, and 28 and 22 is 50. So that accounts for 50% actually reaches the ground. So what does it do when it gets there? Well, <clears throat> I mentioned this one earlier, so I'm not gonna stop here. This is the discussion of the albedo. I was wrong, the moon is a lot higher than that. I thought it was 1% and 7%, but it's a lot less than the earth. <clears throat> 
And that's primarily due to the fact that it has very dark surfaces and has no atmosphere to reflect. Okay, so I thought we were gonna get, um, okay, we're gonna talk about uh, that energy that reaches the surface of the earth is absorbed and uh, some of it is re-radiated. Some of it is absorbed by plants and that energy then is stored in chemical bonds. Uh, some of it is uh, absorbed and re-radiated at it, usually at a longer wavelength. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the amount of cloud cover is a dominant feature in how much light is reflected. And there's a difference between the amount of light reflected from land versus water. Right? Land doesn't reflect a lot of, of uh, radiation, whereas water does. Uh, I got that backwards. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Yeah, land reflects um, more than water, but it also depends on the angle. Right? We studied that in optics in, in the first, uh, first semester. So as the angle decreases, you get more reflection from the surface of the water. Okay, we can get scattering in the atmosphere. Um, gas mo molecules, dust particles, water molecules that are not condensed, but they're still there. They're, they're in, the, uh, in the mixture. Water molecules that are not condensed will scatter uh, light. Excuse me. Um, and some of it is sent back into space. Some of it is, is scattered toward the earth. It's, it's random. There's a special type of scattering called a Raleigh scattering, which is named after Lord Raleigh, who developed the theory. And um, it is a way of quantifying the amount of scattering that occurs um, based upon the wavelength of light. So the amount of scattering that occurs is dependent upon the wavelength and it's inversely proportional to the fourth power of the wavelength. So what that means is the longer the wavelength, the less the scattering because it's in the denominator. So as this number gets bigger, you get less scattering. So that means that the longer wavelengths penetrate to the surface of the earth more efficiently than the higher wavelengths. And the, those in the blue region of the spectrum tend to scatter more. That's why on a bright day, like, like it is today with no clouds, the sky looks blue because uh, the blue light is scattered and the red and greens and, and the middle wavelengths are not scattered. Um, and this works not just in our atmosphere, but it works in any clouds in the universe. So when light passes through a nebula, which is a um, well, you know about that because you studied it last semester. As light penetrates the nebula, um, infrared light penetrates more efficiently because it's longer wavelength. And the visible uh, wavelengths uh, are, tend to be absorbed. So that's why the recently deployed James Webb Space Telescope operates primarily in the infrared region so that it can see deeper into space through those clouds. 
that's one of the reasons. Um, another major reason is that as you look farther and farther away, the source of the light is traveling faster and faster. So you get that um, Doppler shift, it makes the wavelengths longer. So if you want to see them, you need a telescope that's, <laughs> that's built to see the longer wavelengths. So for those two reasons, the James Webb, James Webb telescope is, is built to investigate infrared wavelengths. Okay, and that statement is just what I already told you. It's, it's there in black and white now. So how about, how do we heat the atmosphere? Well, based on that figure that I showed you earlier, only about 15% of the insulation is directly absorbed by the atmosphere. And that's primarily due to differential wavelength absorption. So the molecules in the atmosphere tend to absorb in a narrow band of wavelengths. And that only takes out part of the energy that's being delivered by the white light from the sun. Um, so um, that's not enough to account for the heat that's delivered to the atmosphere. So where does it come from? Well, um, after the ozone primarily absorbs that radiation, um, the wavelength of light, um, now the ultraviolet has been absorbed and now we have a narrow region of visible light that uh, tends to, including infrared, that penetrates uh, through the atmosphere. So once this 50% of the total reaches the Earth's surface, what does it do? Okay. Well, one thing it can do is it can directly heat the atmosphere, uh, but not primarily from the radiation itself. Some of that does occur, and that's primarily because uh, as we go deeper in the atmosphere, we get a denser atmosphere. So there are more molecules. More molecules means that there's more chance for them to absorb light. But that's not the major component. The major reason for absorption of light uh, that's falling on the earth is indirect. In other words, the light is absorbed by the earth and it's either re-radiated or the earth heats up and by simple conduction delivers energy to the lower atmosphere, very close to the surface. Okay, let's see, I mentioned two of them. Let's see if I missed the third one. Um, terrestrial re-radiation, yes. So light is re-radiated, and now it's at longer wavelengths, which the lower atmosphere can absorb. Uh, okay, I'll talk about that one in a second. Conduction, I did mention that one. Absorption of re-radiation and conduction. There's this other one, the latent heat of condensation. So what happens is we heat the surface of the Earth, and um, energy is absorbed by the earth and delivered to water. Water evaporates. As we heat the water, it evaporates and carries energy with it. And as it migrates up through the atmosphere, it tends to cool as it goes higher. And when it reaches a certain temperature called the dew point, it condenses. It goes from gas to liquid. Right. It goes from gas to liquid. Okay, think about what's going on at the microscopic level in a gas and a liquid. A gas, the molecules are very far apart. They have lots of energy. That's why they're gases. When it turns into a liquid, those molecules come closer together 
and they don't move as much, right? They've lost energy. So that energy, when this condenses, that energy has to go somewhere. And what it does is it heats the air around it. So that's called the latent heat of condensation. It's the amount of heat that's required to convert a certain amount of liquid to gas. And in this case, we're talking about water primarily. So when it goes the other way, it gives up that heat. So those three reasons account for the heating of the troposphere by solar radiation. Okay, so the Earth is going to radiate that energy. And the wavelength of the radiation emitted by the Earth is inversely related to its temperature. So as the temperature of the Earth increases, the uh, wavelength um, decreases. It gets shorter, right? As this term, which is in the denominator, as this term gets smaller, then the wavelength gets shorter, right? Which means uh, toward the blue end, the ultraviolet end, the radiation. So as the temperature increases, we uh, shorten the wavelength and make it more blue. This is often referred to as black body radiation. As you increase the temperature, a totally black body that makes no energy of its own will radiate energy at shorter and shorter wavelengths as we increase the temperature. And um, you got introduced to that concept when we were studying uh, the life cycle of stars in the first semester. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> what that means is, since the temperature of the uh, Earth's surface is, is very low, really, it's gonna re-radiate at longer wavelengths. Those are called thermal wavelengths. Everybody knows thermal wavelengths. All you have to do is um, uh, go to a restaurant, if they'll let you, and stick your hand under one of those um, infrared lamps that they use to keep your food warm, right? The cook sets it up on that, on the tray, on the shelf, and there are heat lamps over it. And they are radiating infrared radiation at thermal wavelengths, and they keep your food warm. <laughs> so when this um, re-radiation of infrared light occurs, it's going to heat the lower atmosphere, and it heats the lower atmosphere primarily due to two uh, chemicals, water and carbon dioxide. Water, primarily because there's so much of it, and carbon dioxide because it uh, preferentially absorbs in the infrared region. Now, there are other molecules that absorb, but they're at lower concentrations. So they have a higher specific absorptivity, we say. Uh, methane is one of those. It's much, much more efficient at absorbing infrared radiation than carbon dioxide is, but there's not very much of it. And water absorbs more of that energy than carbon dioxide because there is so much of it. So water vapor in the atmosphere is actually our thermal blanket, not carbon dioxide. Okay. So that leads us to a discussion of the greenhouse effect. Um, if you've ever worked with a greenhouse, you know that uh, even if you don't have any heat in the greenhouse, that uh, once the sun starts shining and light comes into the greenhouse, it heats it up because it's re-radiating and the glass panes or the plastic panes, whatever the case may be, 
um, help absorb that energy and the and the molecules inside absorb that energy and it tends to build up heat inside the greenhouse. So that's the theory behind uh, the greenhouse effect on Earth is that um, those who actually believe this are saying that carbon dioxide is the primary culprit for the greenhouse effect, when in fact, water vapor is the major component in contributing to the greenhouse effect on Earth. Carbon dioxide has a minuscule effect on the uh, absorption of re-radiated infrared radiation, and consequently, it contributes almost nothing to the greenhouse effect on Earth. Okay. And this is an artist's rendition, right? Light comes in, it's re-radiated and absorbed in the atmosphere um, to keep the surface of the Earth warm. If we didn't have some type of greenhouse effect on the Earth, it would be a very cold place. All right. So what about a runaway greenhouse effect? I mean, that's what some climate scientists think is going to happen to the Earth. We're going to heat it up so much that we melt the polar ice caps and the sea levels rise and um, the Earth just burns to a crisp, which is ludicrous on its face. Anyway, where's the evidence for that? Well, they usually point to Venus. Venus is a bona fide runaway greenhouse effect planet. And one of the reasons is that Venus is closer to the sun than the Earth. Also, Venus has an orbital period of 255 Earth days, and it rotates. Its day length is 243 Earth days. So it's almost tidally locked. Not quite, but almost. So one side of Venus uh, is facing the sun for a, a very long time, has a tendency to heat up a lot. Okay. So uh, with that insulation on one side, what happens? Well, Due to its proximity to the sun, uh, Venus gets about 89% higher insulation than the Earth does. That's one factor. The other factor is its atmosphere is composed largely of carbon dioxide and sulfuric acid. And both of these will absorb re-radiated um, infrared and the concentrations are so high, it's like a greenhouse blanket. Uh, I don't have the exact figures, but it's extremely high and produces a surface temperature of uh, over 400 degrees Celsius, which is enough to melt lead. All right, so that is a bona fide greenhouse effect, a runaway greenhouse on Venus. But its concentration of carbon dioxide and sulfuric acid have to be extremely high in order to generate this runaway greenhouse effect. The same effect on Earth is virtually impossible. It will not happen. And the moral of that story is the Earth is not Venus. All right. Here's the discussion of the latent heat of condensation. I already gave you an overview of it, why it happens, how it happens. So, uh, and, and these just put uh, specifics of where we have um, 540 kilocalories of heat is required to change one kilogram of water into vapor. So when that vapor condenses in the liquid, it gives up that 540 kilocalories as heat. So that's, that's a lot of energy. 
So when we get uh, fog formation or cloud formation, uh, rain condensation into rain, dew, anytime the vapor condenses to the liquid or the solid, for that matter, you get a release of that energy. And that energy then um, is uh, delivered to the atmosphere. Now, conduction um, can occur, right? There are three ways to transfer energy. This is a physics lesson. Conduction. You can transfer energy from one substance to another if they are in contact. So if the atmosphere is in contact with the Earth, heat can be transferred by conduction. The second way is by convection. That's where a whole mass of substance moves from one place to another and carries its energy with it. And the last way is radiation. That's where energy is transferred from one location to another using light. So, um, this is how we're, di we're discussing transfer here based on conduction. Convection can occur in the atmosphere, and radiation can occur as well, especially on a clear night. You ever noticed uh, the windshield of your car? If, the, if there's a lot of moisture in the atmosphere, but it's not condensed yet, and the sun goes down, and you've got a cloudless sky, but the temperature outside is not below freezing. It could be 40 degrees or 45 degrees out. But in the morning, you find ice, frost on your windshield. Why does that occur? Radiation. Radiation is a very effective way of losing energy. So the surface, the windshield, radiates energy to outer space, right? And the difference between the temperature between um, the Earth and outer space is, um, well, it's 270 degrees Celsius difference. So very high, very large difference in temperature. And the rate of transfer of energy is proportional to that temperature to the fourth. It's very efficient. So even on a even if the air temperature is above freezing, you can radiate enough energy from the, the windshield of your car to uh, form frost. In other words, that energy is, uh, the, the glass is cooled so much that moisture in the air will turn to ice. Okay, air is a very poor conductor of uh, energy. So what that means is the transfer of energy from the Earth's surface to, to the air is very localized, very, very uh, narrow uh, blanket of air on the surface of the Earth actually is heated by conduction. Uh, and as you get further from, from uh, up in the troposphere, the temperature decreases. Okay. So in order to study these phenomena and these physical properties of the atmosphere, we need to take measurements. Um, most meteorologists take measurements at least once a day, and sometimes more often than each day. And they're compiled year after year after year. And we form a database. So we say, you'll, you'll hear weather reports that'll say, um, this is the coldest day in a century. Well, that's based upon records. Right? The temperature for this day 
year to year to year is compiled and you can compare this day with that one. Our whole purpose in gathering this information is try to, we're trying to tease out cycles. We're trying to understand how the atmosphere behaves over time and hopefully predict its behavior. Uh, where weather is concerned over the short haul, we wanna know, uh, can we expect severe weather? Do we need to prepare for severe weather? <clears throat> uh, before uh, the uh, weather satellites were placed in orbit, um, coastal regions never knew when a hurricane was coming. Now that we have satellites, we can see the hurricane develop in the ocean and its movement and give people fair warning. So uh, property damage is reduced and loss of life is reduced has been reduced significantly since we've been able to predict the uh, approach of severe weather. It's not been eliminated, but it has been reduced. So what do we measure? Well, we can measure temperature, right? Temperature in the atmosphere, air temperature. Um, with one special caveat, don't let your thermometer sit in the open sun when you take the air temperature because it will absorb energy from the sun directly into that uh, measuring device and give you a false high reading. So the thermometer needs to be shaded. <clears throat> pressure. We can measure pressure, air pressure with a barometer. We can measure humidity, how much water vapor is actually in the air. We can measure uh, both the speed and the direction of wind, right? That's important. You know, how fast is the wind and what direction is it coming from? That's vital information. We measure precipitation. In other words, if that humidity condenses, into liquid water, we can catch it and measure how much it uh, we is, is delivered over a per period of time. Uh, or <clears throat> it may be delivered in the form of snow. We can measure that also. How do we measure air pressure? Well, first of all, pressure is a measure of, it's an intense, intensive factor. In other words, uh, pressure is force divided by area. So pressure is equal to some force divided by a unit area. Right? So if a total force is applied over this area, we just divide the force by area and that gives us pressure. So if we increase the area, the force is going to increase, particularly if it's air pressure. Right? If you measure air pressure over this area, it's going to be a greater force. But since it's spread over a greater area, the pressure is the same. That's an intensive factor. It doesn't matter how big the area, the force is going to grow to match it. And why do we get? pressure from the air because there's a column of air reaching to outer space, bearing down under the influence of gravity, bearing down. And the higher the column, the more pressure. So now we can measure the pressure of the air um, with a device called a barometer. Now, uh, pressure is one of those measurements that can be expressed in a, a host of different units of measure. Pounds per square inch, right? One atmosphere. One atmosphere is the pressure of the atmosphere on average at sea level. Um, so that one atmosphere 
is also about 14.7 pounds per square inch. That's one standard atmosphere of pressure. Um, we can also measure it with the height of a column of a liquid. Um, Galileo did it with water. So he found that a column of water could be supported up to 10 meters high. <clears throat> Uh, Torricelli, who was another Italian, uh, decided instead of using water, he would use mercury. He use mercury because mercury is denser than water, so his column doesn't have to be as high. And Torricelli barometer gave us uh, one atmosphere is 76 centimeters or 760 millimeters of mercury. So the air pressure is bearing down on this pool of mercury and it's forcing the mercury up the tube. Now, why can it do that, right? Because there's a vacuum up here. There's nothing pushing on it from here. The only thing countering the weight of the atmosphere is the weight of that mercury column, okay? So that's a measure of atmospheric pressure. So we can say, one atmosphere is equal to 14.7 pounds per square inch, which is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. Right. Those are three, those are all equivalent. Okay. Um, What Torricelli and others noticed was that if you let the barometer just sit it on your desktop and measure it each day, then it is not constant. It varies. And they eventually associated that variability with approaching weather systems. So if bad weather was on the way, the barometer would drop. And after the bad weather passed, it would go back up and even higher. And they associated that with what would, we would we call today low pressure versus high pressure weather systems. And bad weather for low pressure, good weather with high pressure. Okay, so there's our one atmosphere. Now, the international system, or SI units, for pressure happen to be nanometers per cubic meter, uh, excuse me, newtons per square meter. Newton is a measure of force in the international system, and square meters, of course, is area. So we, it turns out that uh, this is also equal to 1.013 times 10 to the fifth newtons per square meter. Okay, all of those are equal. Okay. Um, this can also be called tor. Tor and millimeter mercury are exactly the same. The tor was adopted. Um, to honor Torricelli. Um, one bar, let's see. No, uh, 1,013 millibars. Millibar is one atmosphere. So for all intents and purposes, um, one bar is approximately one atmosphere. It's not exact, but it's very close. Okay, the problem with the mercury barometer, I mean, the good thing about the mercury barometer is extremely accurate and reproducible over long periods of time. And it's easy to calibrate so that you can get consistent readings over time. But 
it does have mercury in it, right? It's, it's not portable, not easily portable. Uh, so other forms of uh, air pressure measurement were developed. And one is the aneroid barometer. The aneroid barometer is derived from, the name is derived from um, A, which means not, the prefix A means not, and neron, which is the Greek for water, which in, for our purposes means no liquid. So aneron or aneroid barometer has no liquid in it. There's no mercury in there. There's no water. There's nothing. It's all solid mechanical. And it's based upon a, a sealed metal diaphragm attached to a, uh, uh, a, a dial of some kind. In fact, you can, you can make one yourself. All you need is a bottle and a rubber diaphragm right here that's sealed like that, okay? And then you have um, a long rod sticking out there, not a heavy rod, a light rod. And then here's your scale. So as the pressure increases, it pushes down on that membrane and compresses the gas inside and moves it up like that, increased pressure. Or if decreased pressure and it bulges out, it'll go down like that. So that's the basic concept behind the aneroid barometer. Now, of course, rather than having a dial, the, the diaphragm is connected to an electronic device that sends an electrical signal to a circuit board and it interprets that as um, pressure and reads it out on a, a digital scale. How about humidity? Humidity is the measure of water vapor in the air. So we gotta say, okay, now how do we measure that? Well, uh, one way to measure it is actually how much water is there in each volume of, of air? Absolute humidity. So it just says uh, how many grams, or I think we use a term called grains, of water exist in a cubic meter of air. Well, actually, this example in the US, we use cubic feet. So, so many grains per cubic feet, where one pound equals 7,000 grains, or 7,000 grains equals 15.4 grams. Well, excuse me, the conversion factor is 15.4 grams per grain. So, you can convert these things back and forth, but the important thing is the absolute humidity measures the absolute amount of water vapor contained in a volume of gas, of atmosphere. And that's useful, but sometimes it's more useful to say, all right, suppose at a given temperature, this water will hold a certain amount of water vapor, but um, it's not, it, there's not that much in there, right? We call it saturation. What's the saturation humidity of the air? How much would hold all of the water it can hold and no more? That would be 100% saturation. So we've got a little bit less water in the vapor phase in that volume of water. What's the ratio between the absolute amount and the actual amount? What's, what could be the maximum that the water could hold and what does it actually have? And then you ratio those two. And that gives you a term called percent 
or relative humidity. What's the relative amount of water that's vapor that's in the get the atmosphere? That's the one we see quoted in in the weather reports. Okay, so it's simpler. Relative humidity is the actual concentration versus the maximum concentration times 100. That's the relative humidity <clears throat> as a percentage. And we know from experience that if the relative humidity goes up, goes very high, you can get, you can become very uncomfortable because as you generate heat in your body, your body tries to get rid of that heat um, primarily by sweating. And as the water evaporates from your skin, it carries all that heat with it, right? Latent heat of vaporization is carried away from your body. Well, the rate at which water is vaporized from your body depends upon the relative humidity. So the higher the amount of water that's already in the atmosphere, the lower the amount that can escape from your body and you don't cool as efficiently. That's why in places like Arizona and New Mexico, where the relative humidity is very low, the temperature can be 105 degrees, 110 degrees outside. And as long as you're well hydrated, it doesn't feel very hot because you are cooling yourself efficiently by evaporation. Whereas um, in Louisiana, where I worked for uh, 13 years, outdoors uh, in agriculture, um, I would work out there and it would be 95 degrees Fahrenheit and 95% humidity, relative humidity, and it was unbearable. You would sweat and sweat and sweat, but nothing evaporated. So it was very uncomfortable. Okay. Um, so another way of thinking of it is, just how full of moisture is this volume of air? That's what relative humidity tells you. And that relative humidity is based upon the temperature because the higher the temperature, the more moisture that can be held in the vapor phase in the air. So if we have a fixed amount of vapor, water in this volume of air, we increase the temperature, the relative humidity goes down because now it can hold more. Okay. So warm air has a greater capacity to hold water vapor than cold air does. Right. Um, let's see. Oh, and for our study of weather, as the temperature goes down, the air can hold less humidity. And there's a point at which we reach a temperature where the air is 100% saturated, can't hold anymore. And if we decrease the temperature any further, some of that water has to condense because it can't hold anymore. So it comes out and that's when we get precipitation. That's known as the dew point. Now, um, I talked, uh, mentioned the uh, difficulty in uh, working in an environment where the relative humidity was 95% and the temperature was 95 degrees. Um, meteorologists have uh, standardized that expression of discomfort in terms of the heat index. And the heat index takes into consideration both the temperature and the humidity and the ability of our bodies to cool by evaporating that perspiration. So they use a formula that's that's really complex but it's converted into a chart so 
how hot does it really feel is what I'm saying. If the humidity is very high, it's going to feel warmer than the temperature says it is because you can't uh, evaporate moisture and keep yourself cool. So here's the, here's the formula. I just put this here for, for a common interest. You don't have to memorize this thing. Um, the heat index is based upon this formula. And you got temperature in here, and you got uh, relative humidity, and you got another combination of temperature. So there are various factors in here taken into account. Um, and the temperature is in degrees Fahrenheit because in this country, weather is reported in degrees Fahrenheit, not degrees Celsius. And the a chart like this is derived. So it's color coded. You're in extreme danger of heat prostration if you're in the red zone. If the relative humidity is, is on this scale and the temperature is here, so let's say, let's go to, to where uh, I'm working out in the field in Louisiana. 95 degree air temperature right here and follow it across to 95% humidity. It's off the chart, right? So I was actually in danger uh, by working in those, under those conditions. Um, but if we were in, um, say, New Mexico, and the temperature is up here at 110 degrees, but the relative humidity, humidity is only about 5%, um, you should use caution, but you're not nearly in as much danger as, um, as if you were in the red zone. Or even if it was 95 degrees in New Mexico and only 5% humidity, you'd be perfectly fine. Okay, I mentioned the dew point. By definition, the dew point is, is a temperature at which a sample of air uh, must be cooled to become saturated. That's the temperature at which the air is 100% relative humidity. So you may suspect that uh, the, the dew point will vary. So when you cool below the dew point, the air becomes supersaturated and generally speaking, will condense some of that moisture out. And depending on where it occurs and what temperature uh, that the, the dew point is, whether it comes out as liquid water or as uh, frozen water, as ice, sleet, snow, whatever the case may be. Now, um, measuring this relative humidity if we had to actually determine the amount of moisture in the air at a given temperature um, for saturation purposes and for actual to ratio them, that would be very tedious indeed. But it has been done. And that data that was developed from those procedures was translated into another table so that we could use a device and uh, very easily determine the relative humidity. It's called wet bulb, dry bulb. It's a psychrometer. The psychrometer is the device, but it's often referred to as wet bulb here, dry bulb there. The wet bulb gives you the temperature at 100% humidity. And the dry bulb gives you the actual uh, temperature of the air. Uh, sometimes you'll see the, the device on a, a chain and you'll have a, a wet bulb one and you'll have a dry bulb on that, on this board and you swing it around. And that's so that the water vapor can evaporate from the wick and cool the uh, th wet bulb down uh, as low as it will go. Okay, so what do we do then? Well, we read the temperature on the dry bulb. That's the actual temperature. Then we read the temperature on the wet bulb. That shows how depressed 
um, how efficient the water is evaporating. So the wet bulb temperature is going to be much lower if we get more evaporation. So the relative humidity, if it's very low, the difference between the dry bulb and the wet bulb is going to be greater, a much wider gap, if the relative humidity is very low. Okay. So we've got some tables. Uh, this is a problem that we're going to work on, but we're going to use tables in the next couple of slides. So let me flip to those slides first and show you those. Okay. The first slide um, reads the relative humidity in these numbers right here in the body of the table are relative humidity. And it's based upon this air temperature plus the difference between the air, the dry bulb, and the wet bulb. So notice as the temperature difference increases, the relative humidity decreases. So this chart also tells you what's the maximum moisture that can be held in grains per cubic foot. Right? So as the air temperature increases, you can get more uh, capacity for that volume of air. Okay, that's one. The next one reads the dew point. So if we read that uh, difference in temperature plus the dry bulb temperature, we can see what is the dew point. So how cold would we have to, to make the air in order for that uh, air to become saturated? So these two tables we're gonna use back here with this question. Using the psychrometer, we have a reading of 80 degrees Fahrenheit for the dry bulb and 73 degrees Fahrenheit for the wet bulb. So there's a difference of seven degrees Fahrenheit, okay? So we wanna know what's the relative humidity and what's the maximum moisture capacity And then the, let's see, actual moisture and dew point. Okay, I forgot to point one of them out. Hold on a second. Maximum uh, Oh, it's a calculated value, excuse me. So the actual moisture content requires that we take the relative humidity as a fractional, not percent, but as a fractional, multiply it by the maximum uh, moisture capacity. And that will give us the actual moisture content. Okay, so relative humidity, right? We're given 80 degrees dry bulb and seven degrees difference. Okay, so 80 degrees dry and seven degrees different goes where? Well, let's go to the next chart. Okay, there's seven here and 80 degrees dry bulb is here. So we follow it across to 70 and the um, relative humidity is 72%. Okay, 72% relative humidity. or 0 0.72 of the maximum. So the actual content is 0 0.72 times the moisture content, which would be uh, maximum moisture content at 70, let's see, was it 80 degrees, 80 degrees, 10.9 grains per cubic foot. And then we can calculate what is the actual moisture content of the air. All right, let's go back. Uh, let's see. Oh, it's in the next slide, excuse me. Here we go. So we got 
and we had 10.9 grains per cubic foot. Multiplied by 0.72, we get 7.8 grains per cubic foot is the actual moisture content of the air. The dew point we read from the second one. Okay, let's go back. So at 80 degrees, the dew point with a seven degree difference, the dew point is 70 degrees. So if we cool that air down to 70 degrees, we will get condensation. All right. So that's how you use those charts. Let's see. Get this back on. Here we go. Has a tendency to walk on me. Anemometer and wind vanes. This is what's known as a weather station. So an anemometer measures the wind speed. Anemos meaning wind and meter meaning measure. So you notice these cups up here. It's, they're set up in such a way that the resistance to the cup moving this way is almost nothing. And the wind catches it and moves it. And it spins the anemometer. And based upon the um, revolutions per minute, the rate of spinning, that can be related to the wind speed. Okay. Otherwise known as a cup anemometer. Uh, there are other types of anemometers, um, little handheld devices with a little fan in them. So you can hold it up like that and the fan spins. And then it's converted to a wind speed. The wind, the vane, the wind vane here, this device, and this device are set up so that uh, when the wind blows, right, the anemometer is, is uh, universal direction. You don't know what direction the wind's coming from. So the wind vane is needed to tell us what direction the wind is coming from. And it's set up so that if, if the wind changes, it pushes on those veins and points in a different direction. So if it's equally pushing on both sides, it's facing the wind. If the wind moves, then it pushes more on this side and turns the vane into the wind. So what we're saying is the wind direction is reported as direction from which the wind is coming. So when we say there's a, a, a nor'easter, uh, say we were in New England, and there's a nor'easter coming. The wind is coming from the northeast, and it's bringing some pretty bad weather with it. Most of the weather in this part of the country, in fact, for most of the United States, the wind directions are uh, basically west, northwest in that direction. Precipitation, how do we measure precipitation? Well, rainfall is easy. You just need a, a rain gauge. And a rain gauge is a device. It has a funnel here and a gauge there. That's marked off, it's calibrated. So if you gather rain from that area and you funnel it down into this one, that means that these markings have to be stretched out because um, you're measuring um, rainfall as inches. So if, we, if the gauge were actually this wide, we would measure inches up here. But it's difficult to measure small differences in height. So we funnel it down into this device and then it, it makes the, the uh, change in height more pronounced. But this is calibrated so that it takes into effect the size of that funnel. Um, 
Okay, so that's how we measure rainfall. How do you measure snow? Okay, if it's snow and not rain. Well, first of all, we report everything in inches. So inches of rainfall over a 24 hour period. And one assumption that has to be made is that when you measure rainfall with this gauge, uh, you're assuming that it is representative of an entire area. So you have to be, you have to place your gauge. And in fact, your whole weather station has to be placed strategically to where you think that it will give you an accurate reading for a region. In other words, you don't want to put your rain gauge under a tree. <laughs> It needs to be out in the open. Um, snowfall is reported as, as a depth in inches also. But in order to do it, um, you need to have a solid base to make your measurement with, with a simple uh, yardstick. Um, so typically what you do is when you see snow's coming, you take a sheet of plywood and lay it out on the, on the grass or somewhere in the open. And after so much time, you go out and measure it down to that hard surface. That gives you a more accurate reading. Now, the actual amount of water that translates from that measurement of snow depends upon the density of the snow. Everybody knows who lived in northern climates, there's a uh, powdery snow and then there's heavy snow right and there's a huge difference between the amount of water that the melt will produce heavy snow melt produces much more water than fluffy snow melt so sometimes um, a liquid equivalent is also measured and your your rain gauge will have a, a heater in it so as the snow flaw falls onto your rain gauge uh, there's just a very small amount of heat, just enough to melt it, and the snow falls, melts, and runs down, and you measure it as uh, water equivalent. <clears throat> okay. Now, those are very simple ways of measuring um, weather conditions, those weather observations. But in recent times, We've developed some rather sophisticated way, ways of measuring, um, making weather observations. One is radar. Radar stands for radio detecting and ranging. Uh, initially, radar was, was developed um, by the Allies, well, actually, uh, the Axis powers during World War II also had their forms of radar. Um, to detect incoming aircraft, so you could you could prepare for it and intercept the um, enemy aircraft uh, with a more concentrated force because you knew the direction and speed they were coming from. But um, <clears throat> the technology over the decades has been adapted so that we can use it for uh, weather observations. Now that requires a different frequency for the radar. Uh, what you're actually doing is you're measuring, you're bouncing radar waves, uh, radio waves off of uh, water molecules, condensed water molecules. So when you, when you bounce them off of a, a cloud, you should see a reflection of some kind. And the intensity of the reflection tells you uh, how much rain on a relative basis is being delivered and obviously the severity of the weather approaching. Um, they can also be um, tuned to reflect off of uh, snowflakes and, and ice as well. Okay, so in its simplest form, it just tells you how far away the uh, weather system is and how fast it's moving, because you can make measurements over time and tell how fast it's moving. 
Another innovation that's occurred over time is called the Doppler radar. Remember the Doppler effect. The wavelength of light that is bounced off of the water molecules or the, the dew drops or the raindrops will be shifted slightly if they're moving toward you when you bounce the waves off of them. So if you bounce the wave off of them, they'll be shortened. If they're moving away, they'll be made longer. And the modern electronic can interpret those very slight differences and give you a, uh, a visual indicator of whether the rain's moving away from you or toward you. It also, because the, the rain droplets are being carried by the winds, that can be interpreted as wind speed also within the system. Okay, this type of radar, the Doppler, can be used to detect circulation patterns in the system. It can show you circulations like this because you can see the, some moving away and some towards you and some not moving at all. And you can see a cyclonic or uh, rotation. And that, if it's very compact in a small area, that can be interpreted as a tornado. And this can be used as early warning and is used as early warning. Okay, other ways of detecting systems. Satellites. The first weather satellite was, was put in place in 1966. And it was, it was very crude. <laughs> the images delivered by that satellite were, by today's standards, um, uh, unusable. Now we have a system of, of um, geostationary satellites. That is, they're placed so high that they rotate their revolution around the Earth is at the same angular rate as the rotation of the Earth. So they will make one revolution around the Earth every 24 hours, exactly. Now in physics class, we, we calculate that value, but um, we didn't do it in, this, in the, the first semester, I don't think, because that was, that was beyond. But these satellites are positioned and they watch the weather and they watch it in several wavelengths. They watch it in wavelengths that can see the water, the moisture, those invisible uh, that can see the cloud cover circulation. And they have several others that give them more information. <clears throat> and this information is, is relayed to Earth and is interpreted by um, NOAA, the National Oceanic Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration is responsible for uh, compiling this data. And they deliver it through the National Weather Service to, uh, for uh, uh, public consumption. Okay. So if you want more information, I've, I've put the link here from, uh, actually, uh, NASA is the, uh, Uh, maintains the satellites. So if you go to this location here, you get an overview of the, uh, the GO satellites. And if you want specific images, you can go to this location and uh, actually see the output from these satellites. Okay. So how do we characterize motion of air? Because uh, very few days, if ever, on the surface of the earth, will the wind be absolutely calm? That it happens, but it's very rare. Most of the time there is wind. Wind is an expression of horizontal movement. Air is moving um, north to south, uh, northeast to southwest, whatever the direction is. Uh, it moves horizontally. But wind does, the air doesn't only move horizontally, it also moves vertically. And for that, we call it currents. So when we say wind, we mean horizontal. When we say air current, we mean vertical. 
updrafts, downdrafts. Let's see. Here we go. So um, we mentioned gravity as one primary force acting upon atmospheric gases. But there's also pressure differences. And these are generated due to temperature variations based upon uh, simple gas laws. So if we change the temperature, we expand the air, and that means there's less of it in a certain area, which generates lower pressure. So these pressure differences between masses of air generate both wind and currents. The force of gravity is always directed downward. That's just a given toward the center of the Earth. <clears throat> so that means that the air is going to be denser near the Earth's surface. Whereas air pressure varies by temperature um, and obeys all the gas laws. So if uh, the pressure of the gas is proportional to temperature, and that, that squiggly there is a P, uh, pressure, this is temperature, that means that as the Temperature increases, the pressure increases. There will be a pressure difference. If you see, if you see um, pressure of this gas mass, this mass of gas is high and this is low, then the air is going to be moving, being forced from the high pressure to the low pressure. And that's where you get. Um, winds. Um, this constitutes an unbalanced force, this difference in pressure, right? Pressure is force per unit area. So if there's a difference in pressure, there's a difference in force pushing the, this mass of gas from a high to, towards a low pressure. Now, how do we deal with that um, as, as a practical matter? I mean, this was all theoretical. We take barometric readings over a large area and we can map them. And what we can do is if we have pressure readings all over the map, we can connect by a line um, identical pressure readings. We can go from this one to that one and draw a line for them. And then from this one to that one, draw a line. Those are called isobars. Bar refers to pressure, iso means same. They're all the same pressure. Lines of equal pressure, that is an isobar. We could say the same thing for temperature. If we made temperature measurements and drew lines, we'd have an, an uh, ice, let's see. I was going to say isotemp, but I think there's another word for it. But, um, hold that one in reserve until we need it. Now, air movement doesn't occur along the bar. It occurs perpendicular to the bar because if this bar is at one pressure and this bar is at another pressure, let's see there, then if this is high and this is low, then the air is going to be moving that direction. So we can draw um, vector lines. In other words, lines with arrowheads on them showing the direction of movement. So the wind direction here, notice that this is a high pressure isobar, a lower pressure, a lower pressure, and a lower pressure. So the wind is going to be moving from the high pressure to the low pressure, right? And they're not parallel here. They're perpendicular to the isobar. OK. So we also know uh, I used a capital P here for pressure instead of a small P. Uh, 
So we also know that pressure and volume are proportional to temperature. And that's based upon, um, actually, the ideal gas equation will tell you that. When we looked at our gas laws, right? So if we, if we have, um, if this is the same, these are the same, then this is a, um, a ratio of these two to temperature. Okay. So they're proportional. A change in temperature will cause a change in pressure and or a change in volume. You can have one or the other or both at the same time, depending on the conditions. If there's a change in volume, then we also get a change in density. Because, like I said before, the mass doesn't change. So if we change the volume, we change the density. So if we heat air, it expands. Decrease the volume, uh, increase the volume, excuse me, increase the volume, decrease the density. And if we cool the air, it contracts, becomes more dense. So cool air tends to sink because it's more dense. And heated air tends to rise because it's less dense. That's the whole concept behind the hot air balloon. You heat the air and it rises. Now, what does that have to do with the Earth and its atmosphere? Unequal heating of the Earth's surface and the atmosphere above it leads to these thermal circulations, either wind or currents and both actually. So uh, on, a short, on a short time scale, daily fluctuations, we find that things like um, uh, the difference between water and land creates um, during the day, uh, sea breezes, that is, um, winds moving from the air onto the land. And that's primarily due to the fact that water doesn't change temperature very fast with the same energy as land does. Land heats up faster because it has a lower heat capacity than water does. So we get water is still cool and land's getting hot. So we get a vertical um current of hot air and air moves in off the sea to replace it and we get that circulation whereas at night the land cools down faster so now the sea is warmer than the land and we get a re reverse direction as a consequence Notice that sea breezes are based upon what direction is the wind coming from? It's coming from the sea. Like a weather vane, the wind's coming from the sea. So it's a sea breeze. Or the wind's coming from the land. Uh, excuse me. The winds, uh, if we're out in a boat and we feel the wind in our face, it's coming from the land. So we point in our vane at the land and say, come in this way. Now this one, the Coriolis uh, force, is going to take some explaining. And actually, <laughs> understand that the Coriolis force is not a true force. Um, it's really a, an artifact of the frame of reference. So we need to show an example to, to define what that means. Uh, it's only used because it helps um, rationalize the movements of air currents and winds um, 
and reconcile them with the other laws of motion. So, um, and actually, it can be demonstrated um, using uh, solid projectiles, not, not just uh, winds. So, if we fire a projectile and we fire it um, from the North Pole toward the South Pole, then as it moves through its trajectory, the Earth is moving underneath it. Let's see, uh, deflected to the right in the Northern Hemisphere. That depends on your perspective, whether you're looking at it from the South or from the North. Let's get a picture here. Here we go. So here's a projectile. And in this case, we are firing the projectile from the North Pole. And we're aiming at a point down here to the south. If the, if the Earth were not rotating, it would travel straight south and land down here. But once we fire it into the air, and it has, it has no side-to-side uh, -side momentum of its own because we're at the North Pole, right? So it's, it's, it's sitting right here, and it has no um, mo momentum or deflection that we're giving it from the beginning. We're shooting straight south. Well, the Earth is going to rotate underneath it, right? And the Earth rotates from um, west to east like that, rotates like that, counterclockwise from the North Pole. So when it does that, our projectile is still traveling and the Earth moves underneath it. <laughs> and it lands down here because our frame of reference is rotating. Now, if we fired from the South Pole, it would end up over here also, but from the South Pole perspective, it would move to the left instead of to the right. <laughs> Okay. So how, well, how does that affect air motion? Well, remember we said that air is going to move from high to low. So if it's a low pressure, the air is going to move toward the low. If it's a high pressure, it's going to move away from the high toward a low. And if there's no rotary motion in our frame of reference, then it'll just simply move away or move toward if it's a low pressure. But if we're in the northern hemisphere and the air is moving toward that low, but our frame of reference is rotating, then it tends to um, draw the air into that low pressure in a counterclockwise fashion. So that's why we say air rotation around a low pressure system is that's known as cyclonic rotation. Whereas around a high pressure, the air is moving away from the high pressure in an anti-cyclonic direction, clockwise. And it's all due to this Coriolis effect. All righty. Now that's on a local scale. How does that affect global circulation? Well, um, let's see. What we get when the Earth is heated, uh, let's look at it in terms of the whole Earth. 
So if the sun is shining in from this side, right, and heating up the earth, where is it heating the earth most? On the equator, right? The air is heating up on the equator a lot. So we get a current of rising air right here. Okay. So where, if we move air out of that region, what's going to happen? It's going to decrease the pressure here, and the air is going to move in from either side. So we get air moving in from here and from here. Okay. That's, uh, as a general rule, that's what happens. But as it turns out, the Earth is more complex than that. And we get to actually get uh, regions of circulation of currents. So this will happen here, but it'll, it'll drop down here like this very shortly. And then it'll heat up again and move like that. So we get, we get several regions from equator to the North Pole, equator to the South Pole, where we get this type of circulation. And then once you start the circulation, you still got the earth moving underneath, right? <laughs> so it moves underneath and that tends to deflect. It would be a, a very uniform rise, uh, crossover, drop, and continue the cycle. But since the earth is moving, it tends to twist that rising around. So it complicates it, and turns into a, uh, any number of different patterns, circulation patterns. So here's what we find. Um, here's the equator heating, and you get this rising up and down. But as it twists, it tends to break with the next possible cell. And that's where we get various types of winds. Here we have the, the uh, trade winds, which generally come from northeast to southwest. And here we get the westerlies that go from southwest to northeast. And then you have a polar. So we actually have basically three regions here where you have significant surface winds uh, as opposed to um, circular um, currents. Um, and these were the winds that uh, Columbus used, the uh, trade winds, were those that brought him to the uh, island of Hispaniola when he landed. He didn't land on mainland North America. Uh, Columbus landed on, um, let's see, what's now known as Dominican Republic. Because the winds blew in that direction. Okay, and then you can get in here in between them, the wind tends to be relatively calm. So once you, if you, if you get into these regions, then you might sit there for a while before you have wind enough to carry you out. Okay, so these are general circulation patterns. And they influence the direction of weather in the northern and southern hemispheres. OK. So let's uh, focus on the contiguous, or what we call conterminous, conterminous United States. That is the lower 48 states. Okay. Alaska gets a different weather pattern, uh, which is primarily Siberian. And uh, Hawaii gets a tropical weather pattern. So we're talking about the lower 48 states. What happens here? Our, the United States generally lies in this region that we call the westerlies. So most often the, wet, the winds come from the west, northwest, southeast, predominantly. Okay, that being said, 
there are regions of the upper troposphere that tend to develop um, very fast moving um, wind speeds, jet streams, we call them. And they're often considered um, what we call, let's see, what's the proper term? Guiding, no, that's not right, guiding winds. So if you see um, a jet stream that's plotted and it dips way down toward the south, that means you're going to have cold temperatures in the mid, mid part of the country. And you'll even get cold temperatures down. In fact, this recent frost we had in Florida was due to the fact that the jet stream dipped way down into Florida. And that, that usually happens in the winter, if, if at all. <laughs> and if you can, if your airplane can go to those altitudes and you can find that jet stream, you can ride that jet stream at, uh, and save fuel and get where you're going faster. My brother's a pilot, and he's, he's told me on numer numerous occasions, uh, these jet streams are plotted out by the weather surface. And if he knows he's going to be heading in the direction that the jet stream is, he'll request um, from air traffic control if he can move to that altitude and catch that jet stream. And <laughs> it, uh, it takes you someplace really fast. Now, we didn't know about the jet streams until uh, World War II, when some of our aircraft would reach up to almost, they would catch some of the lower reaches of the jet stream. And then later, when with the advent of the jet aircraft, uh, we would get up into the, the thick of the jet streams. By that time, we knew they were there and started to develop ways of plotting where they were. Uh, okay, so here's an example. Here's a jet stream in the winter that dips down into the central U.S. and brings with it colder air from the north. All right, so our last topic. I've been going on now for quite a while. Our last topic is clouds. So what are clouds? First of all, what are they? And then what good are they? Why do we need to study them? Clouds are buoyant masses in the atmosphere composed of visible water droplets and or ice crystals. <clears throat> so the only reason you can see a cloud is because water has condensed and it now it reflects light. If there are no clouds, you can't see the water. It's a it's water vapor in mixed with the gases, which makes it a perfect solution, and you see right through it. Okay, clouds are interesting to anyone who studies weather based upon their size, uh, their shape, and their expected behavior. And they're one of the very few visible keys to the weather. Clouds can tell you a lot about what's going on in the atmosphere. If you know how to read them. Airline pilots have been using, um, have been studying clouds um, probably as long as, as um, well, not as long as meteorologists have, but um, they're very interested in them because uh, the type of cloud can tell you whether you're in for severe weather and you may want to go around. Or now with jet aircraft, sometimes you can go over. But what would um, appear to us as non-pilots, uh, as innocuous clouds, um, will clue the pilot into potential severe turbulence. Right? So it doesn't have to be necessarily uh, rainstorms, but the cloud structure, the type of cloud can tell you whether you're in for turbulence. 
and you may want to avoid it. Okay, clouds are classified based upon their shape, upon their general appearance, which is kind of a, a blending of shape, and their altitude, where do they occur? And the naming conventions that we use now were proposed by uh, Luke Howard. He was a British chemist in 1802, but he was also enthusiastic about weather and, and clouds. He studied them extensively and drew them in his notebooks. And he proposed a system for, for naming the clouds. And we still use it today. Um, there are four basic root names that are used to describe the cloud's shape and appearance. And then we go from there, from that root. Okay. First, cirrus. If cirrus is in the name, then the cloud has sort of a wispy or fibrous form. Cirrus comes from the Latin that means curl. So they tend to, they have kind of a, a brushy look to them often called a mare's tail or an artist's brush. Cumulus. Cumulus comes from the Latin word that means heap. It's piled up in heaps, round, billowy forms. These can be separated into clumps, or they can be combined into a larger um, structure, but they, you can still see the heaps within them. That's a cumulus form. Stratus, which means strewn. But in terms of clouds, it means they're stratified or layered. They form in layers. So if we said something was a stratocumulus, it would still have that uh, puffy round form, but it would be layered out in, in a, a very narrow layered form. So you can combine the words also to describe your cloud. And the last one is more, not so much uh, what it looks like as what it does. Nimbus clouds, which nimbus means cloud, is a cloud from which precipitation is occurring or threatens to occur. So if we say nimbus, that means you can expect rain if you don't already have it. Okay, these are the roots. <clears throat> now, when we actually classify clouds, the first order of classification is how high is it above the ground? And this designates a family. High clouds occur around four miles and above, and this can vary, right? Um, medium clouds or middle clouds can occur between one and four miles, and then low clouds are under one mile high. So they're, they're less than 5,000 feet usually. Okay, and this all occurs in the, the troposphere. Okay, that first word, the cirrus, these are, are high clouds. So whenever you see cirrus, you know they're forming very high. Um, they can have sort of a puffy feel to them also. They can be cirrocumulus or they can be cirrostratus. Okay, so those are possibilities. Middle clouds, um, there's the stratus term for layered, but alto means high. So they're high middle, right? They're bumping up against the, the high cloud range. So alto stratus are, are high stratus clouds, layered clouds. Alto cumulus are high cumulus clouds. Low clouds, they could be stratus. They could be the stratocumulus I mentioned before. They can be nimbocumulus. That is rain clouds that look puffy. And then there are two special kinds that um, um, our author, what's his name, 
Luke Howard, our author didn't mention. They're special cases. They're fogs, when fogs form. Fogs form basically by two mechanisms, and we'll cover those in a few minutes. And then the last one, these clouds uh, stick to their level. They're in this level, low, medium, or high. But sometimes clouds cross boundaries and have vertical development. Okay, uh, some cumulus clouds will do that. And then a cumulus cloud that has extreme vertical development um, usually um, provides rain. So that is a cumulonimbus, often known as a thunderhead. Okay, this is another way to organize your thoughts. Stratus, alto stratus, cirrus, cumulus, and these occur at the different heights. And I've uh, included some information here that your textbook doesn't, just to help, try to help you uh, organize your thoughts. Examples over Pascagoula, Mississippi. That's uh, uh, down in southern Mississippi near the Gulf of Mexico. These alto cumulus. So they're high cumulus clouds. You see, they're still sort of puffy, but they're high. Uh, that was just one example. Water vapor in the air is invisible. Okay. But water can become visible if it condenses into small droplets. That's where you get your clouds. In order to form the cloud, we have to get condensation. So remember the dew point. If the water vapor is at a temperature above the dew point, you won't get clouds because there won't be any condensation. But if for some reason the temperature drops in that mass, then you get condensation in cloud form. So one way that that can form is if the mass is is heated and it tends starts rising then as it rises it expands and cools expanding gas means cooling gas and once it cools to a certain temperature then it develops condensation and you got a cloud all right Air in the troposphere sphere is always moving. It might feel calm where you are, but believe me, just go up a few feet and the air is always moving. That's why uh, the holy grail of wind turbines is to get a wind turbine up at a thousand feet or higher, because up there, the wind is always moving and you can always produce power from it. The trick is to get your wind turbine up there. <laughs> so air is constantly moving in the troposphere. And when the air cools sufficiently, uh, either by rising or maybe what happens is a warm body of air comes into contact with a cool body of air. And where that interface is, it cools down this warm body below its dew point and forms clouds. We often call that a front. Or if you get, um, I think we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk more about this in the next chapter, but if you get um, warm air here, moving that direction, and it moves over cold air, then what happens is the cold air slides underneath and the warm goes up. Well, besides exchanging uh, energy here and cooling the warm air, as it rides up, it has to cool, right? As it goes higher, it expands and cools. And you get your clouds formed up here. 
Okay. Um, and that is known as uh, the air motion there is a current. But the wind got it there, pushed the warm air there. You can do the same thing with cold air. So if cold air comes along and it's moving under warm air, it will drive the warm air up and uh, you get condensation in clouds. So here's a vertical development, right? This is a cumulonimbus or a thunderhead, right? You can see the nimbus development down here, right? Um, excuse me, the cumulus development down here and you can see here that it's raining. Right? So that makes it a nimbus. But you can also see the anvil on top, which is spread out due to uh, air uh, winds at, the, the, at that altitude, which is pushing it from side to side. But it's also getting very cold up there. Remember, as you go up in the troposphere, you decrease the temperature. You can get this so cold that it forms ice crystals. And you can tell that you form ice crystals based upon the definition of the cloud itself. Down here where you have the cumulus forming, you see um, very uh, sharp defined cloud boundaries. But up here, you get the very uh, diffuse boundaries. And that's due to the fact that you have ice crystals gathering up there. Okay. Okay, why does air rise? Why do we get the currents? Well, you may rise due to heating, right? That's one way. Um, in Louisiana, I talked about that earlier. In Louisiana, in the summer particularly, um, the heat builds during the day, builds up, builds up, and the air heats up, and the, and the, the, uh, moist air uh, rises, so much so that in the afternoon, it rises so high that it cools, and you get what's called convection showers. And in the summer, they happen almost every day. And actually, they're welcome, because <laughs> when it rains, temperature is 95. When it rains, the temperature will drop into the low mid to, to upper 70s and that's a relief so that's rising air you can also get uh, action of winds which um, have a, a lifting effect uh, that i showed you on the board just a minute ago as warm air is lifted excuse me as warm air is lifted it cools and the uh, uh, energy inside the, the mass drops below the dew point and you get cloud formation. Now, as a general rule, we mentioned earlier um, that the, as you go up in the troposphere, the temperature generally decreases by 6.5 degrees Celsius for every kilometer or three and a half degrees Fahrenheit for every thousand feet. This is called the lapse rate. The lapse rate is the change in temperature with altitude. Now, how stable are clouds? A very high lapse rate means very unstable air. And the rapid rising of air uh, in a, uh, in a, with a high lapse rate will produce condensation very rapidly and usually rain. So within those nimbus clouds, those cumulonimbus in particular, the, the, inter the air inside is moving very fast up and that drives that anvil up on top and the rapid rise causes lots of moisture to drop very quickly. So in a, under a cumulonimbus cloud, you generally get 
very high rates of precipitation, lots of rain per hour, because the lapse rate is very high also. Okay. And it'll keep rising until the buoyancy of the rising air matches the surrounding air and then it'll stop. And under that, under those conditions, we say it's now stable. And that defines the upper limit of the cloud structure. And um, as a matter of definition, we get a stable layer of air that's now uniform in temperature and density. <laughs> so what do we mean by cloud base? That's the height at which the cloud has formed, the bottom of the cloud. And that's the point where the air temperature uh, think of it as this whole mass is moving up, and at some point, it moves up to the dew point at a height where the dew point causes the cloud formation. The air can still be moving, but the cloud stays there. So it's sort of a dynamic situation where you don't see a change in the cloud very much, unless you time-lapse uh, photography, but you won't see a very rapid change in the structure of the cloud but the air is still moving and the dew point is established at that point. That's the cloud base. The thickness of the cloud determines how high does it have to go to reach stable air? When does it stabilize? And that determines the overall thickness of the cloud. And this, as a, just as a teaser question, in a clear blue sky, right? On this day when I'm making this video outside, there's not a cloud in the sky. Is there any moisture in the air? Oh yeah, there's moisture. Right? And we can find out how much moisture there is. We just use our psychrometer and find out what the relative humidity is, what its maximum content is, find out how much moisture. But there are no clouds because the moisture in the air has not reached the dew point. Okay, this one last slide. I found a video at this address. It is an excellent description of, it organizes uh, cloud structure and naming. So if you have the time, it takes 34 minutes to watch the whole thing, but it's produced by um, uh, Dr. Mel Strong from the University of New Mexico. And it goes through those uh, heights, names, uh, it organizes it very well. And it, it, it would be time well spent. If you have the time, go see this video. Look at right here, this YouTube address. And um, I, I think it will help. Okay, that's it for um, chapter 19.